I remember your solo on the his opening track is Cherokee, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, you burned in solo on that. It was oh, really thank cool. You. Well, Joey really lit a fire under my butt because he, I mean, yeah, there's just nothing you can say about Joey other than he's in sort of his own. Uh, he's like on a planet of his yeah. own, you know, amazing. Yeah. Because like I had some tricky tunes. As a matter of fact, I had a piece called East Coast Attitude. Right. Um, and I remember teaching it to Joey. This is when we did some shows because he said, Mimi said, I know you're a composer. I'd like to do some of your tunes, you know, if you want to share them with me. And this was a this is a tricky piece, you know, really complicated head, a lot of weird rhythm hits. Joey didn't read. So he said, just play it for me slowly. I played it for him slowly one time. Then he said, okay, play it one more time a little faster, and I did, and he starts to play along, and he almost had the entire thing just by ear. By the second time, he had a few notes, and then he said, okay, uh, one more time at that tempo, and uh, by the the fourth or fifth time, he's like, okay, play it up to tempo. I mean, I was just blown away, and he, yeah. he nailed it. He nailed it. There's something that, you know... He's a freak. I, I, yeah, it was just it was just so trippy to me, but it just you know it it sort of reinforces what I talk to all my conservatory students about now. Where they're like, I want I got to work on my chops. I got to work on my chops, and I'm like, man, the only chops you need to work on are these ones, right? Because ultimately, you know, ultimately the technique will fail you. There will always be a time where, for whatever reasons, we the technique will fail. Mm. And but if these are solid. You're going to be okay. You can adapt. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely good advice. During this time, it must have been exciting for you. You're recording records, working with people like Joey D. You're in the Bay Area and having grown up in the Bay Area and, and known Bruce a little bit and some other cats, it seems like that might have been a really wonderful time in the Bay Area, sort of the 90s or so. Uh, yeah. It seemed like there was a cool scene happening in the Bay Area for local jazz musicians that were touring all over. You know, I was just a kid still at that point kind of caught the tail end of places like pearls with vince ladiano and meeting bruce there and peter barche right. and harvey wineapple and yourself and others and you know but this was later in the 90s so what was the scene like for you in the bay area and in, in those sort of mid to early 90s was it thriving like i've heard it really was it was a really um and and it wasn't just the straight ahead jazz scene. The Latin jazz scene was sort of exploding with John Santos. There, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there were just so many uh, in Omar Sosa. There were so many great players. Uh, and so these two communities were both sometimes come together for things, sometimes in their own, <laughs> you know, own festivals or own special concerts. But it was really cool, you know. And there was, you know, it was Joe Henderson, Bobby Hutcherson, right. uh, just a lot of great artists. So it was um, it was pretty cool. And yeah, I ultimately met you through uh, the Jazz Masters Workshop, which was a wonderful thing. I, if I remember correctly, you were doing that. Uh, Are you talking about the one down in, do you mean the Jazz Guitar Intensive or the Masters Workshop down in Santa Cruz? Uh, it might have been, I, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, actually, it might have been Jazz Camp West. Oh, okay, okay. One yeah. way or another, I came across you, and I was so uh, enamored and blown away by your playing. I mean, you had such control over the instrument, such a warm, clean tone, you know, really swinging ideas, and, and you were kind enough to kind of show me the way a little bit uh, back well, then. Well, I think, as, as I recall, Perry, that's you're being humble, because as I remember when you came for the lesson, and, uh, <laughs> you know, people can't see this on the podcast, but I'm being <laughs> ironic uh, about that you know, you're already great. You were already wow. sounding like you were totally, you had so much together. It was just, it was sort of, um, I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to talk to this guy about. I could talk to him about life and yeah. the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is important. As we know, career as a jazz guitar player, that those two things are not easy to always come by. And Well, that's uh, true. That's true. You know, but I think, you know, Perry, I would be remiss if I didn't say that one of the biggest things that happened also during that time for me is that I met Joe Pass and uh, approached him after a gig. And he was kind enough to give me a lesson at his hotel room in San Francisco the next day. Mm -hmm. And that was a tra absolutely transformative experience for me. Yeah, I hear that lineage in your playing, for sure. And Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about that meeting that you had with them? I mean, we're always enamored to hear stories from people oh, that connect us to the grace. it was just extraordinary. Well, what happened is um, I was with a friend, and he was actually playing, doing a concert with Joe Williams, the, the incredible vocalist mm -hmm, at, mm -hmm. um, I want to say, um, 
the Herbst Theater in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And after the show, my friend, a, a good friend that I was with, she said to me at the time, she said, Mimi, now is your time. Go up and introduce yourself. Go up and say something. It's like, no. I. And at, at that time, I felt, you know, I was very shy. I felt awkward, you know, the way we all do and, and kind oh, yeah. of doofy. And I just thought, oh. I, I can't do this. And she practically pushed me up. There was a line. He was signing CDs and talking to people. And I so I finally got up there and I got up my nerve and I said, oh, hi, Joe. My name's Mimi Fox. You know, I was all, I sort of blurted everything out. I was all nervous. And I said, you know, I, I've been transcribing a lot of your stuff and I've studied some with Bruce Foreman. And he goes, well, if you've been studying with Bruce, what do you need me for? He was very <laughs> sort of off putting. And then I kept talking to him and I said, well, I want to work. I've been working on solo guitar stuff and I know you could help me. And I wondered if I could. And he says, all right, all right. He said, come to my hotel room the next day. And he was staying at the Inn of the Opera in San Francisco. So. I got there and he said, Cut, be there at 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock sharp. So, of course, I was there at like 5 or 10 of 10 ready. I had a really nice silk blouse on um, and I, I, you know, I had my guitar. I had all my questions. I had some of his solos that I had transcribed note for note that I wanted to ask him about. I get there and he opens the door. He's in his pajamas and his slippers and he's already smoking a cigar. And so I come in and he says, sit down. And he's, you know, he's like got a little waiting area. It's a nice hotel room. And it's it's got like a little sofa and waiting area and stuff, you know, or whatever you want to call a little parlor room kind of thing. And I can barely breathe because of the cigar. So I'm trying to, you know, (laughs) into this, the smoke uh, inhalation is killing me. But I sit down and he goes, so you want to work on your solo guitar stuff? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, he just barked at me. It was like a drill search. He goes, play something. And so I said, Okay. And so I get out my guitar and I played a piece. And then he goes, he's still smoking a cigar and he goes, play something else. So I, he made me play. He kept barking at me. I played like five or six solo pieces. Wow. I had, I'm not a person that sweats a lot. Oh yeah. But I'm sure I'm you were sweating nervous. profusely, like just dripping yeah. off of me in my new silk blouse. In those days I didn't have a lot of money. So I thought, shit, if I fuck up this blouse, I'm not going to have this for this gig I have, you know, tomorrow night. Shit. And I'm just, it's like the sweat's pouring off of me. But finally, thank God for me, puts the cigar in the ashtray and he puts it out. And it's like, oh my God, thank God. And then he goes, you know, Mimi, and I hadn't heard anyone call me Mimi since my relatives back in New York. Yeah. He goes, you know, Mimi, you play really well. You play really <laughs> well. And then he goes, I don't like you using that 6-9 that chord. That chord was around before I was born. I know you're a smart girl. You're more creative than that. And then he said, and you missed the E flat note when you were doing this run in night and day. You missed the E flat. And I said, yeah, I did miss the E flat. He said, yeah, okay. He said, but you know, he said, you you wouldn't believe the schmucks that come to see me. They can't play their way through a 12-bar blues. He said, I'm so relieved you're here. He he puts out his cigar. So, and then he just... I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I mean, what a great it, was story. An, it was an incredible experience. I, I remember saying to him, uh, it was on his solo from Night and Day, and I said, Joe, I have a question about your fingering here. How are you navigating this passage? And and he said something which is like so funny to me now is that I always make my students laugh. It's like the Holy Grail. He goes, he says, well, Mimi, I'll tell you, when I'm moving up the neck, I use my pinky. And when I'm moving down the neck, I use my index finger. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it was so funny. And and again, just the way Joe said it, Mimi, it it was just, it was hysterical, you know. And then, you know, he said, look, if you want to work on solo guitar, what you should be doing is listening to string quartets, Mm. which was a great thing. Because he said to me, he said, look, the, the two low strings, the E and the A are like the cello the mid-range like the viola you know d and g and then the high strings like the violins and he said listen to string quartets listen to what's going on and he talked to me about classical guitar and what i had played because i had studied that in new york for a few Mm. years and so Mm. we talked about that repertoire and then he said you know he said a few things to me that i'll just never forget oh one is that he said he said you know you have a lot of fire in the belly he said and don't let anybody take that away from you yeah i said I said, okay. And then he said something that was remarkable. I mean, it was remarkable to me at the time. I found myself having to say it to students over the years myself now. But he said, you know, he said, Mimi, I think, well, Mimi, Mimi, I think you're practicing too much. 
he said. And I said, why? And he said, because you're 31 years old. And I was like 31 at that time. He said, you're 31 years old and you're coming to me and you're already burnt out. He said, you shouldn't be burnt out. I want you should still love this music. He said, you got that fire. You got that passion. He said, so take a break. Listen to some Mozart. Listen to this. Listen to this. Take a break from it and take a break from jazz. So I remember that that really, really struck me, really struck me. And oh, yeah. so I, I remember I had a gig, I don't know, a few weeks after this with uh, Perry. You might remember John Watala, a wonderful bass player yeah. in the Bay Area. Yeah. And uh, he used to play, he played some at Pearls with uh, Bruce. And anyway, John and I had this duo gig. And uh, after the gig, we were packing up and just a restaurant gig in the city. And I remember him saying to me, you know, we're packing up and said, Mimi, you're sounding really, really good these days. What have you been doing? And I said, you know, John, I'm just not practicing. And he thought that was really funny. He goes, oh, ha, 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 you're not practicing. But I said, no, man, it's really true. I am not practicing. I'm I've just I've I've just taken these three weeks off. I'm listening and I'm playing, but I'm not actually doing all the woodshedding and practicing and stuff that I had been doing. And he said, "Well, you should keep not practicing. It's work it out well." I said, yeah, "That's keep great." That in mind. So, and then you know, I mean, I think what was the nicest thing that happened with Joe is that he he was just so sweet, uh, you know. As much as you know, he could be kind of gruff, mm -hmm. but afterwards, you know, he's like. Um, you know, why are you out in the Bay Area? You should move to New York. I said, I'm from New York. I said, I had to get away from my family. He said, oh, I could understand that. <laughs> and then he goes, he goes um, oh, that's what he said. He said, you have to learn how to harness that fire and intensity so you don't burn yourself out. Yeah. And that was also a really, a totally valuable, you know, thing that he said to me. You know, and it applies to modern day guitar players as well. You know, I think people are still struggling with those concepts, I mean, I've moved to New York, I've been here for 10 years, and that's, this place is kind of like overdrive, you know, and if you're not careful, you can bring yes. yourself out and do it again and again and again. It's really important advice, and it's just amazing that you have stories from the well, you know, from Joe Pass to share with us. Uh, just moving along here a little bit, uh, I wanted to feature an album of yours that I've always enjoyed, something that you did in 2006 called uh, Perpetually Hip. Uh, it's an all speaking of New York. It's an it's an all star cast of cats from New York here. Uh, I think it, Xavier Davis, the pianist, Harvey S on bass, and uh, Billy Hart on drums. Yeah, yeah. So here is perpetually hip from Mimi Fox from two thousand six. <laughs> that fire oh i love yeah. that 
Sounds so good. I always love the blues you put in your playing. I wanted to mention that earlier. It's such a great, tasteful way of soloing. Um, so that that's a great record, great track. Can you talk a little bit about that experience hanging with those guys and getting to play with guys like Billy Hart? I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a whole other thing. Yeah, it was thing. it was uh, a wonderful experience. What was going on at that time is that I had been playing with Harvey S. a lot um, when I was in New York. Uh, Harvey was generally my first call bass player when I had shows uh, in in the city, mm. and so um, and then we also were. Uh, Harvey came when I played at um, the, um, there was a guitar festival uh, that I played at in Wales and Harvey ended up coming, um, he had some shows in Europe and so he ended up being able to meet me in Wales. So then we started playing a ton and when he was out here, uh, here meaning the Bay Area, he would call me if he had shows out there so we got to be really tight.